Catherine, thank you very much for joining us today at Doha Forum. Tell us, how would you define health security? Well, thanks for the opportunity to be here and to speak on such an important topic. So, health security in its broadest sense is the prevention and mitigation of threats to human health. Global, I would say, represents the constant flows and connections among people all across the world, flows of information and products and goods and ourselves. Health, more than just the absence of disease, a total state of wellness, and one which the WHO has defined as fundamental to the attainment of peace and security. Security would be the, the mitigation of any possible threats to our vital systems, our economic systems, defense systems, etc. So when we put it all together, we can really think about human health as a foundational aspect of our, our national security and our global security. Traditionally, global health security has targeted two different kinds of threats. Risk, prevention of the risk of, of pandemic and infectious disease, and the prevention and mitigation of bioterrorist attacks. And you recently published a paper that's centered on, on, on those threats and opportunities to global health security. Uh, and you emphasize there the importance of collective action uh, in tackling threats. Now, where do willing states, where do states that are willing to actually you know, impart action uh, begin in this regard when they're faced with, with growing nationalism and, and waning multilateralism? So that's a, that's a great question. There, there are two, two uh, particular aspects of that question I'd like to tackle. The first is that there, there has been really uh, inc uh, incredible growing momentum within this space, particularly through the global health security agenda uh, and, and its revised framework, which now encompasses almost everything from the prevention of antimicrobial resistance, or AMR, to workforce development, to be able to target uh, emerging threats. Uh, and this is rooted within the, uh, the international health regulations. But of course, uh, the, the issue which is, which is perennial to many multilateral organizations and agreements is that they often lack teeth. So to date, uh, the, the latest stats that I've seen show that only about 15% of, of countries that ascribe to the international health regulations uh, are, are actually compliant um, completely. So if we think about sort of the waning uh, um, interest in providing humanitarian aid, um, this rise of nationalism, this, this um, uh, sort of um, re uh, retreating away from, from those sort of more traditional modes of humanitarian aid, we run the risk of missing the second and third order social and economic um, uh, impacts that can come to bear from these kinds of investments. And if, if we start to think creatively, we start to take a systems analysis approach that really follows the downstream impacts of, say, an, an investment in, in workforce development of, uh, of a particular healthcare system. Um, we can start to think about how this, in fact, does become a means of bolstering security. We are only as strong and we are only as healthy as our weakest our weakest society on the planet. So if we don't start seeing sort of investment in a global sense, if we don't start seeing the sort of, um, uh, uh, the fact that we are unified um, by uh, these particular health threats, uh, we miss the mark and we, and, and, and we endanger our populations. Sure, sure. Now let's take a look at, at technology and, in, and innovation. Technology seems to be something of a, a cause and a cure for threats to uh, global health security when you think about uh, data hacks, for example, and accessing medical data, very sensitive data. Um, what's your interpretation of the role that technology plays? Well, I think it, it as in many cases, as you mentioned, it's, it's both promise and peril. It's, mm. it's a double-edged sword across the board. So when we think both in terms of global health and global health security, we could take something like uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning that might assist within the detection of a particular infectious disease threat, but also the identification of a proper uh, medical countermeasure. However, virtually every form of machine learning at this particular point is uh, is subject to uh, or, or, or vulnerable to to existing risks uh, for a uh, for a hack. How will we know if if a particular AI or, or, or machine learning uh, uh, tool sure. is accurate or whether or not it's been hacked? Uh, I think another area that uh, is is. Um, gaining prominence, but, uh, but is also particularly vulnerable within this space, uh, is, uh, is within the space of genetic engineering or, or CRISPR technology. Let's look at climate change also. That's obviously another factor we've got to address. Um, it's another factor that's compounding health security. And in fact, there's a, there's a, there's a report from um, World Health Organization that found that uh, the direct damage of 
climate change to, to security, it's estimated to reach uh, between two and four billion dollars by 2030. Talk us through the influence that, that climate change is having in that regard. So it's not just climate change, right? So climate change will, will obviously impact the uh, uh, the spread of vector-borne diseases. Um, so we, we've known this, we've, we've been observing this for, for decades now. Um, I think it's also worth considering the mental health impacts, uh, as well as the downstream social and economic uh, well-being impacts that we'll see along the way. But it's not just climate change, especially when we're considering the landscape of, of uh, global health security. Yeah. We can also think about the massive uh, economic impacts uh, as well as the death toll from, say, antimicrobial resistance. By the year 2050, if left unaddressed, uh, that death toll could rival that of cancer. And also, if left unaddressed, it could, could uh, reach costs upwards of 7 to $10 billion for your average uh, healthcare system. That's one aspect. The other aspect, of course, that's coming to bear on this too, another costly problem in terms of of quality of life uh, and an actual economic cost would be in the mental health and behavioral health crises. So uh, expenditures for depression alone are in uh, upwards of 200 billion in the United States. Uh, virtually half of adolescents and young adults face some kind of mental disorder. Um, and that's not even to say anything of, of the, the, the rising opioid crisis, which uh, for, for all of its uh, multifaceted causes uh, has, has no sort of easy fix solutions in sight. So we're seeing all of these issues kind of come to bear at one point. And, and um, one of the things that we explored within the work was really testing uh, the bounds of, of the scope and operation of global health security, right? So the more that you sort of throw everything into the pot, the, the more difficult it can be, uh, again, to, um, to garner support uh, or to find sort of real actionable items uh, to target. But again, I think when we, when we think creatively about linkages across, um, across different systems, and we think about how one investment could have these sort of downstream effects, uh, we might be able to, to uh, join forces and then um, hopefully gather more support from there. I want to touch on misinformation and disinformation. That's obviously very timely topics. Um, very well publicized. Talk us through the damage you see them doing to, to health security. You know, you think about things like vaccine hesitancy, um, the damage that might be doing. Talk us through that. What are your, what are your thoughts? Right. Uh, so that, that's, that's a, a, a phenomenal point. And I think one where it's hard to get people more sort of uh, impassioned by anything than their own health uh, and the health of their family. I think the, the anti-vaxxer movement is a really great example of the overall lost in, loss of trust in public institutions, which is something that the Rand Corporation has been uh, evaluating for some time now through our Truth Decay initiative. So that's certainly one issue, and we've seen measles outbreaks occur now all over the world. So these sort of these issues that we once had uh, 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 remedied now appearing uh, in conjunction again with all of the other emerging and continuous threats that we've seen. Uh, also, we have to think about if there were ever risk for an epidemic, or forbid a, a pandemic, the spread of misinformation and disinformation through social media would likely uh, abound uh, and be particularly damaging. And we're already seeing this in the, in the Democratic Republic of the Congo on the ground. Um, how we actually begin to target it, I think we have to get up front and we have to start to bring people into the conversation of, uh, of any sort of public health preparedness. And there are really great efforts that are happening within this space, but there's certainly more that could be done. We need to really think about what those trusted sources could be. And again, I think that goes back to the power of, of these multilateral organizations and agreements uh, and really being able to give them um, not only funding, but, but real support and, and, and teeth, if you will. Absolutely. Catherine, thank you very much. Thank you, Nick.